American history records the Toledo War, a rare instance when two sovereign states took up arms against each other. Ohio and Michigan, after 20 years of sporadic fighting, finally had their differences settled for them. In 1837, the United States Congress awarded the hotly contested Toledo Strip to Ohio, and at the same time, ceded the western portion of the Upper Peninsula to Michigan as a consolation prize for the loss of the Strip. The unpopularity of the decision by Congress might well be summed up by a newspaper editor of the time. Huh. I wonder why they didn't give us a slice of the moon. It would have been more valuable. Agreed. How wrong he was. For only four years later, in 1841, copper was discovered in the Upper Peninsula. For a period of 36 years, from 1847 to 1883, Michigan produced 50% more copper than all of the rest of the country. Three years later, one of the richest iron ore deposits in the world was discovered. The opening of the Sioux Canal in 1855 greatly stimulated iron mining, so much so that for 17 years, up to 1901, Michigan was the leading iron producer in the world. And its virgin forests made it the nation's greatest lumber producer in the country for a period of 20 years, from 1870 to 1890. After Chicago was leveled by the Great Fire of 1871, almost all of the lumber for the city's reconstruction came from Upper Peninsula forests. And the future held the promise of a tourist's mecca of unsurpassed beauty. Historic Mackinac Island. The pictured rocks. Lachineau Islands. Tequamina, largest waterfall in the Midwest. Beautiful streams and lakes teeming with game fish and waterfowl and virgin forests abounding in wildlife. But unfortunately, separating this veritable paradise from the lower peninsula was a four-mile water barrier the Straits of Mackinac, connecting Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, each capable of stirring up some pretty rough weather. No matter which lake was responsible for the storm, the Straits took the brunt of it. The dedication of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883 challenged the imagination of northern Michigan citizens. The Grand Traverse Herald was the first to advocate a Straits crossing. If there is to be a great through route from east to west through Michigan, there must be a sure and permanent crossing at the strait. Then it concluded, shall it be a bridge or a tunnel? A bridge, said a St. Ignace department store owner. His ad featured a pen and ink drawing of the newly opened Brooklyn Bridge with the caption, proposed bridge across the Straits of Mackinac. These were the opening guns in a 70-year struggle for a Straits crossing. Starting in 1921, a number of plans for a Straits crossing were proposed. Among the first was a unique suggestion for a submerged or floating tunnel to connect the peninsulas. Soon afterward, another engineer proposed an elaborate island hopping plan for a series of causeways and bridges, beginning at Sheboygan, leapfrogging to Bois Blanc Island, then across to Round Island, over to the west tip of Mackinac Island, and a final hop across the deep channel to St. Ignace. The complete roundabout crossing totaling 24 miles. While nothing came of these plans, the growing demand for a better Straits Crossing facility did bring some indirect action. The state of Michigan started a ferry service in 1923 supplementing the old railroad boats that had been in operation since the horse and buggy days. The ferries operated between Mackinac City, where all the important lower Michigan roads terminated, and St. Ignace, where all upper peninsula roads converged. 
the shortest route across the straits would obviously be a beeline between these two terminals. Several plans to bridge this direct route were suggested, but the lack of vision or confidence seemed to frustrate every effort. In 1940, the ferry fleet was doubled, but still failed to keep pace with the increasing traffic. Interest in the bridge rose again. This time, a leading engineering firm recommended a double-span suspension bridge across the straits. This plan actually reached the action stage, and a causeway was built from St. Ignace, 4,200 feet south into shallow water. Then came Pearl Harbor. The double suspension bridge was shot right off the drawing board. But with the causeway, the bridge enthusiasts had finally established a beachhead. This causeway stood unused for 16 years. It wasn't until 1950 that the 65th Michigan Legislature created a new Mackinac Bridge Authority, headed by Mr. Prentice M. Brown as chairman. In only three years, this authority accomplished what had been but a dream for 70 years. One of the first acts of the authority was to engage a group of prominent long-span bridge engineers, including the internationally known Dr. David B. Steinman, destined to design the greatest bridge of his career. After a prolonged study came the report, building a bridge across the straits is entirely feasible, both physically and economically. Yes, a bridge that would withstand all the forces of nature winds, ice, and strong currents. Here are the plans. In the designer's own words, a bridge is merely mathematics brought to life. And here's the wherewithal that brought the mathematics to life. A certified check for over $96 million. Now things began to move. Construction men call this fleet the largest concentration of marine equipment ever assembled for a civilian project. The design called for construction of 34 piers. But where do you begin building a bridge? Where do you get a foothold? Engineers, by survey, established the center line of the bridge. Here was the humble forerunner of the great bridge that was to conquer the Straits of Mackinac. Pier 17, one of the two giant anchorages, was chosen as the starting point. With surveying instruments mounted on towers extending down to bedrock, engineers, using triangulation, pinpointed the exact location for Pier 17. Since it was only 88 feet below the waterline, open coffer dam construction could be used. Then on April 25th, 1954, the engineers, using their instruments and radio communications, guided the operation of the men on the barges as they lowered a specially designed bracing, which served not only to mark the sides of Pier 17, but also to help support the coffer dam walls during construction. With the bracing in place, piling was hammered all the way down to bedrock, completely boxing in the skeleton framework. Inside the steel enclosure, on top of the bedrock, were thousands of cubic yards of mud, clay, and stone, overburdened, which had to be removed to make room for the concrete fill. An endless belt dumped a coarse stone aggregate into the coffer dam from self-unloading ore boats. Merritt, Chapman and Scott Corporation, the foundation contractor, using the pre-packed intrusion method of concrete construction, piped a mixture of cement, sand, fly ash and water into the caisson to fill the voids in the stone aggregate, creating a massive 170,000 ton block of concrete. Enough concrete to pave 20 miles of a four-lane superhighway. 
And buried deep in the heart of the anchor pier are the huge steel eye bars, which will permanently anchor the cables that support the bridge. Next came the construction of the two main tower piers. The sections for the caissons were fabricated at the Gary plant of American Bridge. They were then shipped to Alpena, Michigan for assembly. Since these were to be sunk over 200 feet below the surface of the water, prefabricated double-walled steel caissons, 116 feet in diameter, were necessary. Floating the massive caissons to the bridge site was no small chore in itself. It's not difficult to see why someone called these caissons Paul Bunyan's Donuts. Steel four-sided corrals were lowered into position. They would later guide the caissons into place. The caisson with its cutting edge on the bottom was accurately located and sunk to the desired depth. New sections were added as the cutting edge knifed its way down through the overburden. It was then filled with concrete by the same method used in construction of Pier 17. On top of the solid steel and concrete caisson, main tower pedestals rise 25 feet above the water, their tops studded with steel bolts. Thick base plates were fitted over the projecting fingers of steel, a wetting joining the concrete substructure and the steel superstructure into a permanent union to have and to hold from this day forward. On July 2nd, 1955, American Bridge began the gigantic task of erecting the steel superstructure of the world's longest suspension bridge. A floating derrick erected the lower sections of each tower as far as it could reach. Then it helped erect a creeper derrick, which took over where the floating derrick left off. Clinging to the side of the tower, it worked its way upward like an inchworm. But there, the resemblance ends. For this fellow had a straight up climb of over a tenth of a mile, lifting steel sections weighing up to 80 tons in the process. The struts which tie the tower legs together were built up of sturdy steel box sections assuring absolute tower stability. Five months and 13,000 tons later, these creeper derricks topped out towers reaching 552 feet above the water, almost the identical height of the Washington Monument. Then, for an encore, the creepers erected the huge guy derricks on top of the towers, ready for the next phase of construction. And there they stood, lonely sentinels in the middle of the stormy straits. Lonely, yes, and sturdy, too, for they were soon to withstand one of the highest winds ever recorded in the area. To jump the gun on winter and be all set for spring work, the two giant backstay spans were completely assembled on shore floated to the site, and then carefully maneuvered into position. The long spans were slowly coaxed onto their final positions atop the piers and pinned into place. Just in time, too, for the very next day, blustering winter weather arrived work on the bridge stopped until spring. Meanwhile, thousands of deer hunters, backed up for miles in the Upper Peninsula, waited through many chilly, uncomfortable hours. Some with their hunting trophies, others with nothing more to show for their efforts than discouragement and cold feet, impatient for a place on the ferries, which were crawling slowly back and forth across the straits, while still more cars pile up. Not all operations stopped for winter. The flow of steel from American Bridge fabricating plants continued. Storing, sorting, assembling. Logistics, they call it. So that when the weather broke, bridgemen could reach for and find each piece of steel as they needed it. 
then spring 1956 came to the Straits of Mackinac. After the guy derricks limbered their joints, stiffened by the wintry blast, they were ready for the most spectacular phase of suspension bridge construction. Building the giant cables from the thousands of miles of steel wire shipped from the American Steel and Wire Trenton plant. After the wire ropes that were to support the catwalks were suspended to the exact curvature, this special decking made of timber and cyclone fencing was hung in accordion pleated bundles until pulled down along the wire ropes with an assist from the bridgeman. While that trampoline performance, hundreds of feet up, seems to be a display of gymnastic skills, it actually served to speed the spreading of the catwalk. These bridgemen are perfectly at home on their sidewalk in the sky. On July 13th, a handshake marked the completion of the catwalks. With the catwalk secured against the wind, two tramway systems were erected on which the cable spinning wheels would shuttle back and forth between the anchorages. The reels of wire on the anchorages began to roll. First, up through the spinning tower to keep the tension on the wires just right for the spinning operation. With a clang of cowbells warning of their approach, the spinning wheels passed each other in the exact center of the bridge, depositing eight wires with each three and a quarter mile round trip between anchorages. Each round trip took about one half hour. The wires were looped over the strand shoes at both ends of the bridge, like a hank of yarn held between two hands. This was a job requiring precision, coordination, skill, and speed. But always there was the battle against time. 340 wires were to be banded into a single strand. Then, in a predetermined order, 37 strands were to be assembled into a single cable. 300 men, paired off in two shifts, challenged each other to friendly competition with no holds barred. Who could lay the most wire in an eight-hour shift? 30 trips of the wheel were par for the course. The winning crew boasted a record of 32 trips. friendly competitors converted 41,000 miles of steel wire into two enormous 24 and a half inch diameter cables in only 78 days. Hydraulic jacks put the big squeeze on the cables and temporary steel bands were installed at three foot intervals. Then the permanent cable bands were installed. Even during the April to November building season, there were days when no one could work on the bridge. And then, another winter, another hunting season, more hunters, lucky and unlucky, with the long annual wait. Chins up, men. Next year, it'll be different. The ice moved out, heralding spring 1957. The bridgemen returned to their lofty perches. Down below and right on time were the reels of suspender ropes which had previously been used to support the catwalks. They had been removed and during the winter they were stretched, cut into exact length and socketed. A dual use of materials, one of many cost-saving procedures employed by economy-minded American bridge engineers. 368 of these suspender ropes were required.
They were draped over their respective cable bands, where they dangled until they received their sections of the roadway. These sections were assembled on a dock at St. Ignace, then wheeled down a track onto waiting barges and floated to the bridge site. Installing the roadway sections was another fascinating operation that set this bridge apart. sections were required to form the suspended roadway. Since the true parabolic arc of neither the cables nor the roadway would materialize until the full load of the roadway was suspended, the individual sections were not yet in proper alignment when they were raised. Thus, they were merely bolted loosely together until each later fell into place when new sections were added. The exact moment when each section moved into proper alignment was known in advance by engineers who had precisely plotted the entire sequence on electronic computers. For instance, when section number 30 was raised into place, sections 43 and 51, each hundreds of feet away, came into alignment and were then permanently fastened with high strength bolts. It took a lot more than the longest suspension bridge in the world to cross the Straits of Mackinac. Actually, the north and south approaches together are longer than the suspended portion. When you consider that the extensive approaches are, in reality, a series of bridges in themselves, bridges long enough to span many important rivers, then the true magnitude of this part of the job becomes significant. Steel work on the approaches began on April 24, 1956, and was completed early the following year. Quite a feat in itself. All field connections, except those on the main towers, were made with high-strength steel bolts. The biggest job yet for this modern method of connecting steel to steel. Now we come to the last major phase in building this great bridge the installation of the 7,400-foot-long bridge floor, four lanes wide. It, too, is revolutionary in concept. For each pound of material that goes into a suspended roadway, several pounds of steel are required in the structure that supports the roadway. So a special steel grid flooring, I-beam lock, was used to eliminate over 8,000 tons of dead weight to more than cut in half the weight of a conventional roadway. Open flooring was used for the two inner lanes and center mall, not only to eliminate weight, but to achieve aerodynamic stability by giving the winds easy passage. This also lets snow and sleet through to give motorists a safe driving surface during the severe Mackinac winters. Additional weight was saved on the two outer lanes, even though the steel grating was filled with concrete, which was later crowned with a layer of asphalt. And one last benefit, this light flooring speeded up installation and was an important factor in the completion of the record-breaking construction schedule. When the roadway was completed, the main cables had taken on their permanent load and were generously coated with red lead paste. Then an ingenious machine neatly wrapped the cable with a tight protective coating of galvanized wire. 
Crossing the Straits of Mackinac by ferry averaged about two hours, including waiting time. During rush seasons, however, there have been waiting periods as long as 19 hours, with cars backed up as far as 17 miles. Under ideal conditions, ferries could handle only 462 cars per hour. Then, November 1st, 1957, the culmination of a 70-year dream, exactly on schedule. The joining of two halves of a state by the world's longest suspension bridge, spanning the Straits of Mackinac. Destined to take its place among the great engineering feats of modern man. Five miles in length, including its approaches. 19,205 feet of steel construction, 8,614 feet between anchorages, hundreds of men setting new erection and safety records while working two shifts for 42 months, pouring 440,000 cubic yards of concrete, erecting 67,000 tons of steel superstructure to build a bridge with a capacity of six thousand cars an hour. A bridge that reduced crossing time from hours to minutes. But these are merely cold statistics. This graceful and inspiring structure, combining strength and beauty, is another stepping stone in our country's growth. Here is an awesome and enduring monument to the science of bridge building. Here is a triumph of men and materials which forges another vital link in America's expanding highway system and defense plan. A tribute to the far-sighted officials of the great state of Michigan. A tribute to the deep foundation men. And a tribute to the men who forged the steel. Linked it piece by piece, all working together to bring a bridge engineer's mathematics to life. A five-mile stretch of water separates Michigan's two peninsulas. The five state ferries could not handle the traffic at peak periods. Average time of crossing, including waiting, took two hours. The proposed bridge would cut the time to 10 minutes. For many years, the bridge was discussed. In 1939, the highway department made test drillings and found a bridge feasible. In 1952, the legislature gave the bridge authority power to finance and build a bridge. The bridge will rank with the largest in the world. The first and one of the most difficult tasks was to check the underlying rock strata and begin the building of the sturdy foundation. Geologists, engineers, and builders were challenged by the problems involved. Caissons were used as forms in making the concrete bases for the towers. These were double-walled steel cylinders open at top and bottom. Airspace between the walls kept them afloat until ready for sinking in place. The first caisson was started near the lake at Alpena. When the first section was completed, water from Lake Huron was let into the excavation. Once afloat, the caisson could be towed to the straits. On location, it was held in place by frames driven into lake bottom. Sections were brought in on barges and added to the caisson. As sections were added, the caisson was sunk nearer the bottom. Workboats of many types were needed for the huge project. When down to bedrock, the caisson was cleaned out ready for filling with concrete. Mud, dirt, and rock of the overburden were dredged out and dumped outside the caisson. 
Framework for the other piers was fabricated on land. Some of the frames were cylindrical, some were rectangular. Each pier location was carefully checked by surveyors. The piers must be in exactly the right place. The frames were taken to location on barges. They were lowered by derricks until they reached the overburden. This frame was to be part of one of the anchorage piers. Interlocking sheets of steel piling were driven around the frames. This wall of piling made a coffer dam. The space inside the coffer dam could then be dredged clean of overburden. Freighters were filled with crushed rock at Drummond Island. Cement came from Petoskey to Mackinac City by truck. Conveyors loaded the cement onto barges. The barges were then towed to a pier location. A huge mixer was brought in on a barge to make the grout. Crushed rock from the self-unloading freighter was used to fill the coffer dam. Grout was pumped down through small pipes to cement the crushed rock together. As the rock and grout filled the coffer dam, it forced the water out. Winter found the pier ready for erecting the above water supports. A winter inspection showed no damage from ice. Spring, with its ice flows, failed to move this huge caisson. With spring, the workmen continued sinking and cleaning out the second caisson. A load of crushed rock came in by freighter. Freighter with stone and the mixer with the intrusion grout moved in for the filling job. Intrusion grout was forced down through the pipes. Tower sections were fabricated near Pittsburgh and at Gary. These tower columns will support the cables. At the anchorage piers, work started on the above water section. Each anchorage pier will hold one end of the long cables. Frames for the approach piers were also made on land. Welders must be skilled to work at these heights. The frames were towed to location on barges and lowered into place. With the frames in place, drill rigs made further test borings. The cores of rock were saved for study by geologists. After the rock and grout had hardened, the drill was again used to take out large cores. Sections of these concrete cores were tested for hardness and strength. Some sections were set aside for a record. 34 piers are needed for the long bridge. By midsummer of 1955, the piers were ready for the building of the superstructure. Workboats of many types were needed. Cylindrical forms were used for the cable bent piers. The form sections were lifted into place by large derricks. Grout and crushed rock were then poured into the forms. At each cable anchorage pier, a derrick was hoisted to a raised platform. As each level was concreted, the forms were raised to the next. Crushed rock was dumped into the forms by the derrick. The forms went up by stages. The anchor bars were placed. Finally, the huge pier took form. The approach piers were also nearing completion. The caissons had been concreted to eight feet below water level. The tower bases were erected above each tower foundation. Later, the caisson rim was cut below water level to the concrete foundation. This reduced the possibility of ice pressure. The bases were made ready for the towers. Base plates were lowered into place. Then came the first tower sections. The first sections were lifted by floating derricks. 
The floating derrick was also used to erect the creeper derrick on the side of the tower. The creeper derrick then lifted the next sections. The derrick raised more sections until it could reach no higher. It was then raised and rebolted to the tower. Workmen above used telephones to direct the derrick operators on the platform below. The riveting cages moved up the legs of the tower as bolts were replaced by rivets. Men also worked inside the tower legs. The hot rivets were sent from heater to riveter by pneumatic tube. Cross bracing made the tower strong enough to withstand the winds that would sweep through the straits. As the top section went up, it carried the American flag. Each backstay span was built on a trestle placed on two barges. The barges were then towed to the space between a cable bent pier and an anchorage pier. When in place, the barges were partially filled with water and the span settled into place. Bridge spans are suspended from the main cables. This cross-section diagram shows how the 12,580 wires spun into 37 strands of 340 wires each and are compacted into one 24 and a half inch diameter cable. These cable saddles were later placed on the tops of the towers. Catwalks were constructed for the workers. They were made of interwoven fence material fastened to cross pieces every 10 feet and supported by five two and a quarter inch wire ropes. These workmen prepared sections of walk. They then slid them into place on the ropes. The sections were then adjusted and fastened into place. The sections have been brought almost together. Bridgemen crawled across the remaining space to attach lines which would pull the two sections of catwalk together. With one catwalk completed, workmen started erecting the second. Suspension cables would be looped like the catwalks from tower to tower with the ends fastened to the anchorage piers. Each end of each of the 37 strands was attached to the tip of the anchor bar. The bars were embedded in the concrete of the anchorage piers. The piers were very heavy to withstand the pull of the cables. The next picture shows an anchor bar before concreting. An idea of the size of the bars and anchorage piers can be had from comparison with the red derrick on top of the pier. The reels of cable wire were swung into place. The reels weighed 16 tons. The wire traveled from the reels to the spinning wheel. The wheel in reality did not spin, but was merely a simple pulley with grooves for two wires. It pulled the loops of wire across to the other side. An endless rope pulled a wheel from each side at the same time. The cutaway drawing in the next picture shows how the first loop was started across. The two wires can be seen as they come down between the rows of anchor bars. They go under a pulley and up over the wheel. They then go down and are fastened to an anchor bar. Each trip of the wheel added four wires. At the top, 552 feet above water. There is no braiding, twisting, or weaving of the wires. Workmen on the catwalk guide the wires into their proper places next to those previously placed. Here, the workmen are seen guiding the wires from the wheel to the cable at their feet and adjusting the tension on the wires just placed. At the center of the span, the wheels beat. Here, the cable wires can be seen down next to the walk. The wires from the wheel are guided to it by the men. Here, the cable swings above the catwalk. Workmen must climb up onto it to adjust the tension. As cables increase in size, each newly placed set of wires must be adjusted so the tension is the same on each. At the anchorage piers, the wires separate. 
Each wire and strand goes with its anchor bar. Here, a loop being transferred from wheel to anchor bar is seen. Two weeks ahead of schedule, all wires were placed. Later, the cables were squeezed into shape, banded, and wrapped. Highway trusses could then be suspended from them. Meanwhile, the approach spans had been erected out from shore toward the suspension span. Some of these were sizable bridges, ranging up to 560 feet in length. At the end of the construction season, cable spinning was complete, as were all except two approach spans. The bridge could be completed in 1957. Winter again stopped major construction for a few months. In April 1957, workmen of U.S. Steel's American Bridge Division resumed construction on the bridge. Finishing the approach spans came first. This block-long span was cantilevered from the pier at the right to the North Anchorage Pier at the left. It must be strong enough to support itself from one end until the span reaches the Anchorage Pier. This steel cord linked the approach pier with the suspension span. As the cord was swung into place, a workman could walk from the Anchorage Pier onto the approach span. Few of us would be so at ease on the narrow piece of steel 120 feet above water. This steel was pulled into place with a device bridgemen call a come-along. Supported only by the pier, the truss work must hold the heavy weight of the span until the last section could be completed and the span would have support at both ends. The long wire ropes which supported the catwalks have been replaced by short loops over the main cables. The long ropes were then cut into proper lengths for suspender ropes. The wire suspender ropes were looped over the steel clamps fitted around the main cables. Suspender ropes were lifted from the barge below and hung over the cables at intervals of 39 feet. Here the barge with reels of suspender ropes, the tower base with its hoisting equipment, and the lighter green of the water over the foundation can be seen. The caisson reaches from bedrock to about 8 feet below the surface of the water. Each suspender rope had a metal ferrule cast on its end. Fastened into the span, each ferrule held its share of the weight. The roadway truss sections were brought in on barges. Stiffening truss sections were placed in both directions from each tower, thus keeping the structure always in balance. From lifting winches at the base of each tower, the lifting cables went to pulleys on temporary struts across the main cables, thence down to the sections to be lifted. Each section was hoisted into place and bolted to the sections which had previously been erected. Notice the size of the truss work compared to the men working on it. At the center, the truss work is almost level with the cables. Dr. Steinman, the designer, and J.W. Kinney, his resident engineer, use the catwalk while inspecting the bridge. The center stiffening truss section has a different shape than the others. This picture shows one of the last side span stiffening truss sections being pulled into place. Sections must be very carefully designed and assembled as they must fit exactly when placed. Notice the man with the telephone directing the winch operators far back at the tower. At last, a completed bridge framework ready for placing the roadway. From tower to tower, the two main cables with their suspender ropes hold up the long span of stiffening trusses. On these trusses will be built the four-lane roadway. From tower to cable bent pier, the cables support another span of stiffening trusses. Steel makes the base for the roadway. Dr. D.B. Steinman, designer of the bridge, visited the project frequently, placing a stringer for the roadway. 
Here, a derrick is placing sections of steel grating for the outer lanes of the roadway. Later, they were filled with lightweight concrete and surfaced with bituminous concrete. Welding crews made thousands of welds along the steel of the deck. Straddle trucks could carry many tons of steel stringers. The center lanes of open steel gratings allow drafts of air to pass, thus helping eliminate all swaying in heavy winds. Cables were coated with red lead paste and wrapped with a triple spiral of wire. Bridgman used the cable itself as a pathway to and from the tops of the towers. When the huge derricks on the tops of the towers are no longer needed, they are dismantled by men working at greater heights than the top of the Washington Monument. A layer of blacktopping was spread over the concrete roadway of the approach spans. Right on schedule, November 1st, 1957, the bridge was ready for traffic. Governor Williams, bridge authority members, reporters, and editors made an inspection trip before the bridge was opened for traffic. The completed bridge, as seen from the Mackinac City shore, shows that all that remained was to paint the towers ivory and finish painting the superstructure green. Hundreds of men worked in two shifts to complete the bridge in record time. Their accomplishment has become an icon of Michigan and a tribute to the American worker. Those iron workers are remembered in a special museum in Mackinac City, created from a personal collection of J.C. Stilwell. Well, I always thought the men and the engineers and all the trades should be remembered uh, by something, and I just started a museum because I wanted to keep our, I guess, our name in place. Eh? <laughs> J.C.'s collection stems from his time spent working on the bridge, and it's open to the public free of charge. You'll usually find him at his restaurant there, Mama Mia's Pizzeria, where he's happy to answer any questions about the bridge. Is it true that there, uh, there's someone buried in the cement there? No, there's nobody buried in the cement. I was there when all five men died, and there was nobody buried in the cement. The Mackinac Bridge Museum is open seasonally from 7 a.m. till midnight, located above the Mamma Mia Pizzeria on Central Avenue in Mackinac City.